I'm Pat Kuhn, and this is a uh, another philosophical political video um, well, and social commentary. I'm trying to evolve how I'm using my YouTube channel, and I'm going to start talking about social issues and philosophy and things like that. And the purpose of this video is to act as a broad introduction to uh, where I'm coming from. <clears throat> So I thought I'd first start out with a list of people that uh, that I have a certain amount of admiration for, and then a few people who you might think I uh, have admiration for, but I don't actually. And I think uh, I'll explain uh, briefly why with each of these people. So one of the people I strongly admire is Stephen Fry. Uh, I admire his braveness and his openness in dealing with depression and issues of sexuality. Uh, he's also a generally funny and intelligent uh, actor. Um, and he presently runs a, uh, a kind of fake quiz show in the United Kingdom called QI. It stands for quite interesting and it's, it builds on the idea of a, a dinner party. Uh, a dinner party with good intellectual conversation uh, that just goes all over the map. And it loosely structures it into kind of a fake game show with scores that don't really mean anything. Um, no prizes. The, the whole purpose of the show is to have an interesting conversation, but it is prompted by uh, cue cards on various topics. Um, another person that, that I admire is Salman Rushdie. Uh, he's a uh, an author who's uh, kind of takes after Kafka. He's kind of like Murakami in some ways, maybe a little bit closer to reality. Um, and uh, I think he's of Indian or Pakistani descent. Um, uh, he's a secularist, uh, and a lot of his novels are uh, are fairy tales that have some uh, relationship to the history of the separation of Pakistan and uh, and India. And I admire him as an author, but I also admire uh, the stands that he takes. He, he has a very strong principled stand against uh, censorship. Uh, and by censorship, I don't just mean uh, government uh, censorship, but also private censor, uh, censorship and efforts to pander to the easily offended. Um, and I think that that's, that's a pretty important stance to take uh, because both liberalism and conservative in the, uh, conservatism in the United States and in other countries, it ha uh, both of them have branches that are relatively pro and against their own form of censorship, whether it's protecting the, the values and symbols of religion or nationality or whether it's... Uh, protecting the dignity of various ethnic groups, uh, things of that sort. It's, it's long been a contentious issue in society whether, whether and how we should uh, demand respect for these various things. And uh, I admire that uh, Salman Rushdie takes a, a rather strong stance against mandating or even expecting uh, respect. Uh, for these groups. Um, another person that I admire, although this is a more complicated admiration and it's not quite as uh, as broad of one, is Frankie Boyle. Uh, he's a Scottish comedian and uh, he's uh, been on Mock the Week uh, and he's done a lot of stand-up. And he's known for, uh, for having very dark comedy, um, but uh, while his comedy is dark and it it, uh, it doesn't uh, protect the um, unacceptable targets uh, as uh, as they've frequently been called in comedy, uh, he he does if if you uh, read his Twitter feed he does have a social conscience. He just believes that that comedy should generally be blind to uh, or rather that there isn't injustice that comes from comedy. And, and again, I think that just like with literature and just like with Salman Rushdie, that's an important stance to take. Um, 
Uh, Richard Dawkins is another person that I admire. Uh, I admire him for doing popularization of science and also for having a philosophical strong atheism th that, is, that still tries to be reasonably fair. Now by fair I don't mean even, uh, even handed as in trying to f take a middle position so much as not laying criticisms that, uh, that are not uh, backed up by facts or that uh, expose him to easy claims of hypocrisy. And, um, and so he'll, <coughs> he'll, take a, uh, he'll criticize the stances of others for being silly or ludicrous or, um, or leading to really bad results. But generally speaking, he won't lay the kinds of criticisms that, uh, like Christians eat babies or anything like that. And a historical figure that I particularly admire is John Rawls, who uh, was an American political philosopher, and he made uh, what what he uh, what he did uh, that was remarkable was he he made. Uh, he made the case for some relatively easily understood axioms for what a good society looks like in various dimensions, like justice and um, and fairness. <clears throat> and, uh, and from these, you can derive a relatively uh, complete political philosophy that has uh, deep appeal, uh, yet it has significant depth. Um, so he's, he's essentially bridging the gap between abstract uh, political philosophy and, um, and uh, I guess, the general public. Although, it, admittedly, his books are long and maybe a little bit cumbersome, but you can take the, the basic ideas out and explain them to people, and people will say, hmm, you have something there. And that's something for a piece of political philosophy that's, that's saying a lot. Uh, now, the people he, uh, you might think that I admire that I don't, um, P.C. Myers uh, is an example of a relatively prominent uh, atheist and science educator. And I do think that he's uh, quite a good science educator, but I don't think that he, uh, he does atheism any favors in the ways that uh, in, in the ways that he talks about atheism. He's often extremely unfair uh, in his criticisms and uh, he'll say relatively knee-jerk things that if you were to call him on the facts of the matter, uh, he'd have to back off. But he keeps on doing it again and again, which uh, is a sloppiness that, that seems to be based on catharsis that I think is unhealthy. <clears throat> and also his social stances and social activism have become entangled with some of the more radical forms of activism in ways that I think as a community we should avoid. Um, and in particular, if, if you look at how Free Thought Blogs, uh, which is a prominent secular uh, blogging site, how it's actually works out in practice and the people it attracts and the people that it turns away. I don't think that, uh, that that's a healthy secular community and I think we should generally avoid it and we should distance ourselves from him. Uh, which isn't to say that he's always wrong uh, and it isn't meant to demean him as a science educator. It just means that as an exemplar of what uh, social activism in the secular uh, sphere should look like. He does a bad job. Um, another person you might think I admire th uh, that I don't is Sam Harris. Uh, Sam Harris is a neuroscientist and I, I certainly would be willing to respect him in that field, but in his uh, activism, particularly when it ventures into social issues and into philosophy, uh, he makes very bad arguments. Uh, in particular, The Moral Landscape is one of the worst books on its topic that, uh, that you could find. It's not just that it's bad. It's bad in a way that if, if we're really going to be trying to approach uh, topics with rigor, 
we often need to pull away from the easy, most satisfying, uh, most emotionally satisfying conclusions that we could reach uh, if they're uh, if they're uh, based on bad reasoning. And people who who make emotional arguments, uh, people who try to give us the the easy answers that um, that we would love to be able to honestly approach, but we can't. We need to give up on those answers, and Sam Harris is dragging us right towards sloppy, cathartic conclusions that uh, that that are unhealthy. So, uh, yeah, let's let's uh, let's not give Sam Harris respect in those fields. Um, Christopher Hitchens is another person you might think that I admire that I don't. Again, he's uh, he was an eloquent man. He argued for secularism against religion, good causes, uh, but his politics were awful, and he was quite misogynistic. And neither of those are things that I'm willing to uh, I'm willing to forgive. Um, now, going back to a, another historical figure, Nietzsche is somebody who you might think that I admire that I don't. And this is a bit more of a complicated topic for me because at one point in my life I did uh, strongly admire Nietzsche. Uh, now I have a very nuanced and uh, messy relationship with his philosophy. I think that I, his boldness and uh, in going right after the social issues, uh, that's a beautiful thing. And his idea of, of uh, what being a philosopher should look like, that's good stuff. The problem is the content of his philosophy, which is radically individualist, and it's uh, classicist. And by classicist, I mean he's going back to uh, Roman martial virtues. Um, and he, we can kind of forgive this because at the time that he was doing this, he was trying to pull away from Christian morality, which is a good thing. Uh, but he didn't really see enough, well, in my opinion, or at least in my judgment, he didn't really see many other alternatives but, um, but Roman martial virtues. And so he just grabbed onto that and uh, idolized the powerful and idolized building of feelings of power within oneself, which I think is fine if you restrain it to the philosophical uh, plane and you're, you need a certain careful with uh, a care with it to really do it reasonably. <clears throat> but in the end, particularly uh, early in, in Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's uh, uh, in Nietzsche's career, his philosophy was just really ugly. And uh, later on, just like a, a lot of other philosophers, he moderated and uh, did some synthesis of uh, uh, synthesis of his ideas with outside ideas and things become a bit more palatable but even still he uh, he remains not someone who I could uncomplicatedly say uh, I admire <clears throat> so moving on to uh, the the positions that I'll I'll be speaking from in future issues of this and I should note that I've been blogging for many many years uh, on some of these topics, um, and my positions have evolved too over the years. So if you go back to the early stuff, you'll find a very different perspective. Uh, since yeah, it's, it's been well over ten years that I've been blogging, um, but <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I've been blogging about this stuff for years. But uh, I realize that dense walls of text are not necessarily the most uh, most approachable things, and Generally, with writing, it demands your undivided attention. It's uh, unless you have a really good screen reader. Um, if if you're going to uh, approach a uh, a philosophical work, sometimes having some uh, having it in other media uh, can help, or or even having other philosophers explaining it in a more concise way. Um, like take for example Nietzsche. Now, when I started out reading Nietzsche, I was uh, reading it, uh, a translated version in English. And those, uh, and I, uh, I happened to have uh, a rather uh, good set of translations. 
uh, that went into more detail, did cross-referencing of an idea expressed in one place with how it might have been differently expressed in a different book, or provided philosophical background for a few things. Philosophy is such a broad discipline that uh, even people who study it formally, uh, they almost never will catch all of the references on the first several reads, and unless they're extraordinarily re uh, well read, um, they'll probably never catch uh, all the references to begin with. I mean, literar uh, literary analysis is just a field that's like that. Uh, philosophy is it just uh, as a uh, as a field of study, as a formal field, it just helps you catch more. But um, but yeah. Uh, so later on, I did end up reading Nietzsche in German, and uh, I got a lot more uh, out of it in some aspects, although I certainly did need to reach for a translating uh, dictionary uh, pretty often because my, my German is reasonable, but my vocabulary isn't quite up to the task. Uh, but, and it's particularly difficult because Nietzsche used a lot of wordplay. Um, and uh, puns uh, and near puns, things like that. And it, it's hard to catch on to those unless you have a very, very good grasp of the German uh, language, but I caught some of it. <coughs> but in any case, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that this will make, uh, make the positions that I'm arguing for a little bit more accessible and I'll be able to comment on matters, uh, matters of the day uh, more broadly. <clears throat> here. Now, I should note that uh, for most of the videos that I do, I, I don't have extensive notes. Um, with this one, I actually went through to, uh, to build a, a reasonable set of notes, uh, but I'm trying to mainly speak uh, off the cuff uh, for my videos, or at least mostly off the cuff. Um, I'm, not, I'm hoping not to look a lot at uh, my notes most of the time. But um, I, I won't be ashamed to do so, and if you uh, criticize me in the comments section for doing so, it doesn't. It just it doesn't bother me to, uh, to do that. <coughs> so, I'm an atheist. I believe that the, uh, there are no gods, um, no souls, no afterlife. Uh, and, uh, or at least I believe that there's no good reason to believe in gods or any of these other things. I believe that the stories that religions tell about gods and spirits are superstitions when humanity was less able to understand the universe than it is now. And I believe that in the long run, we're better off without, uh, without religion or belief in gods or spirituality. Uh, well, spirituality is a complicated term. <coughs> and uh, I, I, I suppose to I, I can't say that that's an unqualified statement that we're better off without spirituality we would need to go and f uh, figure out what we mean by that term uh, but, but certainly by belief in spirits and chakra and fates and things of that sort I think we're better off with belief uh, in that <coughs> I'm not as hostile to ideas from religion as you might think. Um, and this is basically because religion has existed for a very long time. Uh, it has a long presence in history. It's become entangled with many, many cultures in, in different forms. It has a lot of cultural content. And not all of that is bad. Uh, like Handel's Messiah, great piece of music. Now certainly when you're listening to it, you can uh, you can hear the religious influences. Uh, music is sometimes very communicative, and you get the feeling of someone uh, praying or exalt, uh, uh, like connecting with this idea of divinity. And I, I basically either overlook that or I consider it an interesting bit of cultural content. Uh, but the idea itself is, or I mean, the piece of music itself is wonderful. And similarly, I've studied uh, Sharia and Halakha, which are ideas about how people should live. I, I admittedly am simplifying that because it's a big topic, and I might get into it more in a later video. 
But they're essentially parallel codes of conduct and ways for society to deal with varieties of acts that people do. And I think those are fascinating. Oftentimes you can get really interesting ideas from studying them, despite them having been historically part of a religion. And in fact, they do have religious foundations in them, uh, uh, but that doesn't disqualify them from being interesting or from being worth reading. Uh, so the idea is not to reinvent all of society from scratch once we've pulled away from religion, nor is it actually to pull away very, very rapidly from religion. In the long run, I, I would hope that secularism wins, but uh, I believe that the, the way to do that is by convincing people that this stuff belongs in museums. It's not to ban it or to do uh, anything like that, nor should we feel at all awkward in looking at this stuff for influences, for ideas, for interesting cultural practices. Uh, we should treat these things as a rummage uh, sale, dig through them for good ideas, recycle them, uh, recycle elements of them for whatever we build in the future. And that's basically the way that, uh, that cultural content has always worked. If you look at any of the ideas in any of these religions or ancient philosophies, you find that it's very rare that a cohesive set of them originated all of the ideas. Uh, ideas flow around from society to society, and it's very natural for them to flow outside their native context and to find a new uh, uh, contextual home. And so we should be looking to potentially do that. Now, it doesn't mean that we should be do doing so uh, without concern for how these things fit in our worldview or for our, our ethical or moral considerations or, or things like that. We're, we're not trying to preserve them just for the sake of maintaining a pattern, but we should be willing to include them in, uh, in the future. Uh, elements, not, not the whole thing. I, I think, I, as I said, I don't believe in gods or spirits or anything like that, and I, I don't think that we want to carry uh, the idea of such things uh, into the core of future worldviews but certainly other elements of, uh, of religion and culture as it has been practiced, they're worthy of consideration. And we should try and understand them even if we don't intend to bring, uh, bring them forward because they're interesting. And seeing the, the broader pictures of how humanity has lived, has thought about the world, has dealt with societal issues, it, that's a broadening thing. And Hopefully we're committed to intellectual growth and we're not hostile to broadening uh, ourselves in, uh, in that way. So I'm a philosophical materialist and a psychological reductionist or, uh, and emergentist. And I know that th those might seem contradictory. Uh, I might cover that in a future video. Um, but basically the, the point of, of these statements is I believe that the, the human mind is purely a physical system. Uh, it's essentially a machine. I believe that in principle we can understand that system and that eventually we will understand it and that in principle we could uh, take the dynamics of that system and implement them on other kinds of substrates. That is, I'm a believer in the possibility of hard AI or, or well, strong AI. I, I, I should differentiate those in, in a future video. I don't believe there's anything in the human mental experience that can't be explained in terms of system, system dynamics over uh, neurons. And accordingly, I don't believe in souls or an afterlife. <clears throat> uh, I should note that in good empirical tradition, in the unlikely event that we find otherwise, uh, whatever that otherwise we find is, uh, I'll accept it and I'll want to do science to that system too. Um, and moving on to that, I'm an empiricist. I believe that being driven by data is the best way to approach truth claims. And I believe that science is a fulfillment of empiricism uh, and, and it, it's, it slightly narrows the problem domain and that we're empirical in our day-to-day -day life. 
uh, like, am I spending too recklessly? Uh, well, let's look at the numbers. And we, we, we don't consider that science per se. Science is more about finding the, the rules of existence. But still, science is, broadly speaking, a fulfillment of empiricism and that academia, uh, science within academia, is the best broadly empirical uh, vehicle society has for determining matters of fact. Uh, and this isn't to say that academia is perfect, but it's simply the best uh, social and methodological combination that we've found so far to approach uh, these matters. Uh, next, I'm a moral relativist, uh, which means that uh, when it comes to matters of fact, um, I consider those uh, to be statements about the physical status of the universe. And I place a big uh, philosophical divide between that and matters of should or morality or ethics. Uh, essentially, I, I think shoulds and morality and ethics, broadly speaking, they're not truth claims. And that means that there's no objective or true answer to uh, any of uh, questions about should or morality or ethics. And there are some nuances to this that I'll cover in a future video. And you'll notice as I go through these, I'm laying out topics that uh, future videos hopefully will cover. They are things that I've covered to a certain extent in my blog, uh, but I'm willing to recover them here. Um, now that, uh, and also I should note that this doesn't mean that we shouldn't have positions on matters of, uh, of should or morality or ethics. In fact, uh, not only should we, we must. Uh, if we don't have values, if we don't have shoulds uh, or desires of these kinds, and I think that these things essentially are complicated uh, descendants of values. If we don't have values, then we don't have the should to get out of bed every morning. Uh, we, we lack the ability to approach that question, which basically means that even if we were to imagine a perfectly rational being, um, and, what, and rationality is one of those words that's a very complicated topic, and a lot of people misuse it pretending that it's something quite simple. Uh, and also different people mean different things when they say rationality. So be careful whenever you hear somebody use the word rationality, particularly to, des to describe themselves, uh, since oftentimes it's just a uh, unback uh vanity. But if we were to imagine a perfectly logical being, it still, uh, if it didn't have any values, then we would essentially expect it to be inert. Or why would it communicate if it doesn't have any wants, if it doesn't have any particular desires for what it wants out of the universe, what it's trying to do, even for self-preservation? Then it's essentially a rock. It, it wouldn't have any reason to do anything at all. Uh, so having values is what is uh, kind of intrinsic to existing as uh, a meaningfully active uh, entity. <clears throat> so we can't escape the need for morality. And when I say that I'm a moral relativist, this also doesn't mean that I'm anti-judgmental. Uh, being judgmental is very natural, it's healthy, uh, it's normal. Uh, but what the combination of these things mean is that at heart, there aren't any right answers. Uh, there are essentially arguments, and they're floating uh, in parts of our philosophy where we're kind of ungrounded. And that's natural. There's, there's nothing to be scared about there. But uh, I essentially consider moral absolutism to be a cheap, cathartic, easy answer when faced with the scariness of trying to deal with uh, with actually approaching matters of value uh, properly, that is in a moral, uh, morally relativistic way. Um, but yeah, again, I'll, I'll cover this in more detail in a later video. And I should also note that uh, 
I'm not opposed to building uh, laws based on broad value consensus. And uh, in fact, I, I think that uh, morality and law are necessarily tied. What, what's a law against murder but a law that's based on, on values? Now, people often uh, kvetch about, um, about laws that are based on very specific notions of morality, and I, I might be, be willing to grant more sympathy to that type of criticism, but I don't think that we can escape the realm of morality entirely when we're imagining uh, legal, uh, like I, questions of jurisprudence. So I'm enthused about science. I, I believe that science is a healthy thing for society and a worthwhile passion for an individual. Uh, advancing the frontiers of knowledge is a beautiful thing, and I believe that it should be funded as uh, one of the basic goods of society and one of the basic ends of humanity. I'm both proud of and nervous about civilization. Uh, we're apes. We're a particular species of ape with a trick, intelligence, and a culture that trains some of our instinct out of us so that we can understand who we are and what we're doing. That training is fragile, and yet over centuries we've managed to reach such great heights, uh, despite progress in our politics being dangerously slow. And by progress, I don't mean the liberal use of the term, but rather the pulling back uh, against identity politics, against group thought, against easy slogans, um, and moving towards a more measured, independent, and careful approach to issues. This might not dictate particular political conclusions, might not dictate a particular political stance, but it does uh, dictate a, a, an approach to the questions, uh, how we talk about the issues, how we think about them, and that's something to be proud of. And, uh, and in general, we should be aiming for consistency between uh, between the things that we uh, believe in. And that's, that's something that easily falls by the wayside when we let our passions uh, essentially take the steering wheel in how we approach issues of political philosophy. So basically, with, with society, we should love what we've, uh, what we've achieved and hope to take it further. We accept the faults in our institutions and faults in what we're trying to do when not having those institutions should be worse. And we should also always be aiming to improve uh, those institutions and to mitigate the harms from them when possible in the future. <clears throat> now, I'm nervous about concentrations of power in society that lack accountability. The more visible the mechanics of, uh, of any system of power and the more that they serve the broad public interest, the more willing I am to be comfortable with or not speak against that, uh, that concentration of power. And I should say that I'm more nervous about private power than public power. Um, although I am certainly a, big, uh, a, a general fan of government openness. Now this means that I tend to be more distrustful of corporations than the government, and this doesn't mean that I think governments are saints. If we look at the history of how governments have behaved, uh, in the past, you find, particularly in foreign policy, where uh, in the United States at least few people are paying attention, you find really horrible things happening. And uh, and I I'm, I'm would not hide from those horrors, but rather I would say that the alternative is usually worse and that we can do better in the future. I'm technocratic. Uh, and what this means, I expect expertise to be cherished and that except in areas where values are central to how public choices work out, um, I expect uh, expertise to play a very strong role in how we uh, choose the results in our society. I believe that most of the time in government we should be electing the smartest people with the most expertise uh, possible to fill whatever uh, the roles uh, uh, that are met, uh, or, or whatever the roles need to be met. Um, and, excuse me. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we need to have the head of 
of our political system uh, or the or the higher ups always be the most uh, always be uh, experts alone. Uh, but I I generally think that we should be choosing between experts who still have political passions at the top levels of our government institutions. Uh, excuse me, uh, that's a very inconvenient phone call. But, uh, so yeah, we should be, uh, we should be aiming to have the ex uh, experts, um, we should be aiming to have experts who have uh, the values that we like in, uh, in our political uh, positions. And we should cherish uh, the intellectual, uh, in, uh, particularly when it comes to democratic areas, we should all strive to be more data-driven and more intellectual ourselves as a society. But for those who have achieved uh, greater heights than that, uh, we, should, uh, we should hope to put them in the positions of power because incompetence is just as dangerous as bad values in politics. And, and basically in any institution. Uh, and unless we can, uh, unless we can really move towards having more expertise and power, we're going to keep underachieving as, uh, as a nation. Now, I'm a socialist. What this means is that, uh, so I can approach this from several different angles. Uh, what I'll say is that when it comes to property, uh, I believe that everything fundamentally belongs to society but society allocates things to people and potentially other entities uh, provisionally and it does so through mechanisms of property and uh, that that mechanism of property is not a first principle uh, moral idea rather uh, property is a choice and it's a choice and it's a structure that we set up to uh, do one of three things <clears throat> it's either a reward, uh, I'm sorry, it's either a reward for labor that benefits society, uh, it's, a, it's an allocation that's designed to allow a person or entity to do something societally useful with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, piece of property, or it's uh, something that's allocated to a person for the well-being uh, of that person like uh, food. Uh, and, and so in practice, I, uh, I, I think that we should be willing to alienate property a little bit more fluidly, not necessarily willy-nilly, but, um, but, uh, but we shouldn't treat property as a moral absolute. Uh, or, or even a, even a, a deeply moral I uh, idea. It, it's, it should be considered provisional and uh, and more to the uh, more to broad socialism I believe that instead of having privately owned uh, corporations with ownership dictating structure we should we should have competing co uh, collectives that are owned by their workers and that there should be uh, democracy within each collective uh, when it comes to business decisions, including uh, how people, uh, how much people are paid, and um, and basically, I, socialism, just like capitalism, can exist in a variety of forms. Uh, but these are the two uh, these are the two foundations for uh, that I consider to be absolutely essential to anything I would uh, call socialism. Again, the term is uh, it's used in, in different ways too. Uh, some of them are, are more broad than this, but I would probably say that things that don't uh, things that are too alien to, to this uh, to these two principles don't really they shouldn't be classified as uh, socialism. And I, I might, again, I'm, I'll probably cover this in, uh, more in a later video. I'm for mandatory public education. 
Uh, I believe that parents, when present, have a certain obligation towards their children and have certain uh, prerogatives uh, for deciding uh, aspects of their children's lives. But firstly, I believe that st status is alienable uh, or, uh, or it can be lessened if the parents are doing a really bad job uh, uh, raising their kids. And I believe that it's not the only uh, obligation that exists towards those children. Um, society itself, uh, taken as a whole, has an obligation to all of its children towards their well-being. And I believe that it has a superior obligation to their obligation than the parents do. So I would say that parents can supplement the public education uh, that their children receive, but they can't replace it uh, with private education and they can't withdraw uh, their children from it. Um, essentially, they are caretakers. Uh, our parents are, are caretakers, but they're not the only uh, caretakers. Uh, society as a whole has some, uh, has some caretaking rights towards children and has uh, some uh, prerogative uh, for, uh, for the, uh, over the lives of children. I'm slightly misusing the word there. Um, but I'm, I'm sure you understand what I mean. And for a nurturing society, while law and order need to be maintained through state power and the people of a, na uh, of a nation collectively uh, may have an interest in the laws and policy of the state, most of the goodness of a society comes from enculturating its youth uh, appropriately, providing them with quality edu ed uh, education and uh, making sure that their material needs are met. Nurturing doesn't end entirely when adulthood begins. Uh, people should per, uh, periodically return for more education, and uh, and it shouldn't incur individual debt. Uh, and uh, and other aspects of, of trying to be a nurturing society also apply to adults. We generally should uh, should be shaping our policy to find ways to better provide for the intellectual and uh, and other growth of uh, uh, growth and well-being uh, of the people. I'm for unions and the labor movement. Uh, I think that an adequate understanding of past and ongoing achievements of the, the, the labor movement and unions uh, show that while uh, they're imperfect, we're better off with them than without them. I'm against radical individualism. Uh, I think we must tend to the material needs of everyone in society, and we should be sensitive to their lack. Uh, we should try and uh, <clears throat> to take many of the, the, the basic needs of humanity uh, in society uh, out of the general markets and provide them directly, either, uh, either for the poor or generally for everyone. So there should be a minimum of standard. Uh, or minimum standard of life that, that people have as a guarantee no matter what life choices they make, regardless of their willingness to do uh, this or that. Uh, they're going to have shelter, they're going to have food and water, they're going to have access to education uh, to prepare themselves to, uh, to work again uh, or just to enrich themselves. Um, we aren't necessarily obligated to provide a very comfortable life but we should provide uh, the essentials uh, regardless. I'm for moderate in, uh, engagement of uh, government in cultural matters. I see government as being an expression of society, and I'm willing to contest some forms of government engagement, uh, but I don't have a principled objection to all forms uh, of engagement. And I think that some, like marriage, which is a long legal tradition of uh, engagement uh, in a cultural matter. I think that's healthy. And I, I would call uh, that particular style of engagement as paving a path. And I think it's a good thing for, uh, for government to pave uh, some paths for societally normal or healthy uh, behavior. And we can certainly squabble over the terms and definitions of marriage but I, I'm against uh, efforts to end its legal recognition. I'm for a vibrant, messy, 
and non-respect considering clash of ideas and cultural content. While a certain kind of respect is important in smaller conversations, it should be between people as people, not people as identities. I don't have to respect all of your identities to have a respectful conversation with you. I don't need to care about your identities or know about your identities to have a respectful conversation with you. Uh, and as for other kinds of conversations, when people are speaking to the whole world uh, uh, about general identities, like religions, ethnicities, and so on, we should be comfortable with offending. It shouldn't bother us one bit. And regardless of past abuses, no identities are entitled to dignity or special consideration, nor should people change how they think or talk about identities for the sake of the comfort uh, of others. It's ruder to, to attempt to control the, the thoughts or uh, expressions of others, unless maybe those thoughts or expressions are malicious. And there we're getting into a, a game of trade-offs. but. If there's no malice, if there's no uh, malicious intent, then, then any attempt to control the thoughts or expressions of others, uh, shape somebody's framework uh, for the comfort of, of any particular group, uh, I, I think it's very, very rude uh, to attempt to do that and that we should always reject it. That doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't attempt to persuade people. Uh, but actually, like shunning somebody or expressing uh, expressing much in the way of disapproval for somebody not conforming to talking or thinking in a way that makes uh, somebody comfortable, I, I think that yeah, it's it's rude to try and uh, push people around that way. Um, no group should be entitled to control depiction of their identity. Uh, nor the co cultural uh, elements associated with it. Uh, any attempts at such control should be met with scorn. Taken together, this amounts to an opposite, uh, opposition to political correctness, as I see it. Now, political correctness is a term that means different things to different people. I see mandated respect for identities uh, as being, and by man, uh, mandated is maybe not quite the right word, but much pushiness uh, for respect for identities. Uh, I think that's the heart of political correctness as I see it uh, and as I oppose it. And what this means in practice is that people should be reasonably thick-skinned uh, as a sign of mental health and virtue. <clears throat> uh, I'm for personal ties that are not judgment-free. Uh, nor based on respect for every uh, every component of another person. So I think it's it's fine and healthy to judge life choices and personal traits of others, and we should be understanding that people are going to judge our attributes and our life choices as well. Uh, judgment. Uh, this uh, the way that we judge someone as a whole usually is just a some kind of a weighted sum over all these individual judgments. Like, I like this bit of, of Nancy. I don't like uh, that bit of Nancy. I thought it was brave when she uh, went, to, uh, uh, went, uh, went to a third world country and uh, participate uh, in an exchange program or taught people medicine there. Uh, but I thought that I think that the way that she treats uh, Stacy is highly unfortunate, and and so we build up this notion of of a person as a set of judgments, uh, and you unless a particular matter is really really important to us, like if if somebody does something really really reprehensible, any individual judgment is just a, a small part of how we think about someone as a whole. And I think that that's a healthy way to judge people. Uh, we shouldn't avoid having uh, having judgments. We shouldn't avoid expressing judgments, even if they're for things that are shallow, like not liking fat people, or or finding someone really really ugly, or um, or always being uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable around someone because they don't bathe enough, 
we, we shouldn't be ashamed of having these judgments. And generally, we, we shouldn't be too ashamed about talking about them. Um, oftentimes, we, we, th we make a choice when, uh, when we decide how we're going to speak in society. And I think we often aim a little bit too much towards, uh, towards not rocking the boat. And we should be willing to accept such judgments when they're uh, made of us by others, even if somebody judges us badly for something that we're quite proud of. Not everyone is going to see these things in the same way. Uh, so I'm for uh, discretion uh, in which values we hold are universalizing versus which, uh, which we just hold for our society versus things that we just think would be interesting or good ideas. Um, I'm not afraid to be called culturally imperialist. Um, for, uh, for at least some of the values I would like for all of humanity to adopt. But generally these uh, are more about abstract conceptions of justice rather than anything spe so specific as holidays or national food or uh, things of that sort. I'm feminist in a moderate second wave sense. Uh, what this means is that I believe is, uh, that gender is mostly just about genetics. It's not about how people need to behave or what jobs they're suitable for. Um, and I think that in the workplace, except for maybe personal ties between coworkers if people flirt or something like that, women and men should be treated the same. They should treat each other the same. And they should be eligible for practically all the same jobs, and they should be paid the same, in a perhaps in a performance-based metric, for those jobs. In broader society, women and men should generally be treated equally under the law. In upbringing, boys and girls should be uh, raised mostly, uh, they shouldn't be raised very differently, nor they should, uh, should they be nudged towards different careers. Um, in relationships, generally, there should be a quality of power both formally and in the ability to walk away without disastrous consequences, any exceptions to equality in society require a strong justification uh, related to either ongoing efforts to end injustices, and for these, uh, the, uh, the inequalities need to be for a limited time. Uh, I'm comfortable with some forms of affirmative action, particularly in education, but I, I think that we need to consider these things on a case-by-case -case basis, and we shouldn't be afraid to say no to, to some affirmative action proposals, but generally unaccepting of, the, uh, of affirmative action programs, particularly in education. Uh, or th the differences need to be justified by biology. Um, like having separate bathrooms, fine. Uh, having uh, Having different, uh, having pregnancy leave, I think it's very reasonable, uh, but th those are biological matters. Uh, and I think it's uh, preferable to avoid participating in even private institutions that are gender specific. Um, I don't recognize transgenderism, uh, and I'm using recognize in the sense of one nation deciding to recognize another. Um, but like many other forms of identity, uh, whether well-based or not, nutty or not, see also therians or, uh, or uh, furries, things like that. I oppose bullying or job discrimination towards them. Uh, uh, now, I, there are some, some types of behavior that some of these groups, not, not people who consider themselves trans, but there are some therians that you'll probably find on Tumblr who grumble about uh, about being fired from a job because they howl like a wolf uh, while they're uh, while they're on the clock. I think it's fine to fire them for that. They're attempting to use their uh, their identity to gain a special privilege and uh, kvetching when that privilege isn't granted. Uh, but just for having the status, particularly in a way where it's not job relevant, where it doesn't really come up uh, in any uh, in, in any more than a surface way. Um, I, I think people shouldn't be bullied uh, for being a bit weird uh, or for making really bad life choices um, unless, in, in, 
there are some very nuanced exceptions to this when it comes to like the pro-Anna movement, where I think it's appropriate to try and intervene a bit. Uh, but uh, but otherwise, uh, we shouldn't be accepting bullying of anybody in a society, and we shouldn't generally accept uh, job discrimination or mistreatment uh, of of anybody, uh, whether they're uh, whether they uh, they have unusual or even stupid identities or, uh, or not. Um. <clears throat> I'm anti-racist, and most of what I said about gender and feminism applies for my anti-racism. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm additionally against national, uh, nationalism that includes an ethnic, ho uh, ethnic homeland ideal wherever it applies. Uh, any nation that treats people with a particular ethnicity as being more desirable or gives them special legal rights is problematic. Any private institution in that nation, particularly if those private institutions are big enough, uh, we should be uncomfortable with such preferential treatment. Um, so generally on social justice and identity topics, I'm for taking a, a narrow understanding of oppression and applying it very strongly. Uh, also, I believe that human nature is very complicated and that we're often inconsistent bundles of competing uh, desires Self-understanding is a rare thing, and it often makes life more complicated rather than less. Um, I'm an uh, environmentalist. I believe that we should care for the biosphere and try to construct our cities and organize our lands as humanity to give us reasonable access to seeming nature, real or not, to, um, to avoid polluting, uh, and to try and minimize the lasting damage to, uh, to the biosphere. I'm concerned about centralism and cultural production. I believe we should prefer cultural arrangements where cultural content can arise organically rather than managed by cultural gatekeepers, uh, such as record labels. Uh, I also believe that having plenty of places, commercial or not, where people can meet, talk, and play with each other is important for cultural health. One of the neat things about Portland, Oregon, for example, is that there are parks all over the place uh, just checking on, uh, on the time. Uh, and I think that that's a healthy thing, having big parks uh, where people can play ball, do sport, play chess, just talk. Ha having lots of coffee shops uh, that, that allow this to, these are things that are great in a civilization. Uh, and so I'm, I'm for a conception of society that's not focused entirely or even primarily on material wealth. Quality, quality of life is a more well-rounded concept. Uh, likewise, I think profit maximization is an unhealthy ideal for most parts of society, and that breaking even or making uh, profit just sufficient for security and possibly a slow spread of what, whatever uh, institution, private or public, is being considered, that's often just as good of a metric, and it allows for more room for benefiting society. So those are, uh, that covers much of the, the range of my, of how I see the world and maybe what I'll be talking about in future videos. Comments are welcome. Um, understand that these are just summaries and that uh, I haven't gone into the details yet. If you have questions, um, I'd be happy to try and tackle them if, if they have reasonably short answers, or if you have a longer question, maybe uh, I'll consider it when I'm making a future video. So uh, I'm Pat Gunn, and this has been an introduction to how I see the world.